Yeah, okay. Oh, yes, it's her crackle. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Carrie Rentschler. I'm director of the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies uh, at McGill, and I am one of the co hosts for today's conference. Uh, I'm really excited to see all of you here at 9.30 in the morning. Thank you. <laughs> we will make it worth your while. <laughs> um, this conference has been in the works for quite a while. Uh, it has been co organized between us at the Institute uh, with uh, Studio XX and in conjunction with HTMLs, which is a festival of feminist digital culture and media arts, which is starting today, basically, with our conference uh, and continues through next week. And Sophie's going to tell us a little bit more about some of the events that are happening with the festival if you're in town and hanging out for a while or if you live here already. You can go to a number of the events. The idea behind this um, particular conference was to look at, um, sort of contemplate what we're considering the kind of intersecting, hopeful, and dystopian imaginaries of current futurisms, but with a particular focus on its queer and feminist trajectories. Uh, and the, today's conference is called Feminist Technics, Queer Machines, Inventing Better Futures, to raise a question of sort of how do we imagine the future? from perspectives that are defined by feminist thinking and by queer lives and queer theory. Um, and across that, we have a number of ways of thinking about that that our panelists are going to address for us today. Um, several people made this conference possible. I'm going to be very brief just to sort of get us going and turn it over to Sophie. I really want to thank the Dean of Arts Development Fund at McGill University and Dean Chris McFreddy, who has helped fund this great event. Uh, I want to thank the conference committee which includes Sophie Ho, Katya Meltzer, both from Studio XX and who have worked behind the scenes and at the front of the scene uh, to organize HTMLs. Yuri Furuhata, who's a professor of East Asian Studies at McGill. Katie Zine, who's a professor of English at McGill. And Jess Durantz, who's here today and is going to be chairing and moderating a panel. I also want to thank Studio XX and HTMLs more generally, Sophie, Katya, and Isabel Bouchard. Uh, who have worked tirelessly with us to make this happen and to help publicize it. Media at McGill and uh, their director, Professor Christine Ross, who's helped fund this and is always a great partner in putting on interesting events. And us at the Institute, uh, including our staff, Wilson Blakely, our director of communications, uh, Claire Michaela, who's right there behind the camera, who is our administrative and student affairs coordinator, uh, as well as Crystal Merchant and Aisha Ferrari. Uh, who, make, who help us do what we do. Um, without further ado, let me turn it over to Sophie, who has a few words, and then we will get right to the panel. Bonjour. Uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> uh, thank you, Carrie, so much for that uh, nice introduction. It was, uh, I really want to also uh, you know, like it was a really a pleasure organizing this uh, conference with you. Uh, this is the second time that HTML collaborates with IGSF. Uh, since 2012, uh, we tried to make the festival a transdisciplinary one, um, uh, trying to uh, bring together academics, artists, and activists to think, uh, to engage with each other, but also engage with a the theme. Uh, our theme this year is Your Future. Um, and also, we're happy to uh, give IGSF an excuse to get out of the McGill campus. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I just want to announce that tonight, after the conference, there will also be an uh, opening at the Goethe Institute. We're opening a, a video projection by a German artist, uh, Linda Franke. So you're all welcome to that. Uh, it's at 8, and tomorrow is the official opening of the uh, festival at 4001 Berry. Um, along, uh, so, Citrix 6 Jeeve, and Oboro will be hosting an uh, uh, opening party, uh, three performances, three exhibitions, and um, yeah, it's going to be nice, and uh, you're very welcome to come. And um, there was something else I wanted to say. Oh, yeah, so uh, also in terms of uh, of, of uh, opening uh, with the conference today, uh, really your job uh, is to set the stage. Uh, we wanted to um, uh, ask the questions at the very beginning and so to inspire people, uh, all the participants in thinking about Zero Future. And uh, so thank you uh, for being here today and we're really happy um, uh, to start this festival. Hi, 
thank you everyone. Um, my name is Alex Ketchum and I'm a doctoral student at McGill in the Department of History. I'm very pleased to be able to chair this very exciting panel. Um, each speaker will talk for about 20 minutes and then at the end we'll have time for discussion um, after all the three speakers have gone. So our first presenter for this panel on technology and futurity is Eleanor Duachel. Eleanor is a first year graduate student in art history at the MA level at Concordia University. Her thesis research explores the impact of Imperial Spain's millennial complex on a mid 16th century tapestry based on Ronés Bosch's Hayway and Triptych and commissioned by the Spanish Cardinal Antonio de Granville. She is presently an executive member of the Aboriginal Art Research Group. She completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Detroit Tech Now, Afrofuturism and Cybernetic Theory, Deconstructing the History of New Media Art from the Warehouse Floor is the title of my presentation today. Okay. Um, in the introduction to his book on the influential life of Stuart Brand, let's see here, in his youth, um, who is the founder of the techno-libertarian publication Wired and also the Whole Earth Catalog, um, Author Fred Turner describes Brand's cyber utopian vision as one where, quote, the individual self, so long trapped in the human body, would finally be free to step outside its fleshy confines. Um, Brand also founded the Well, which is the um, whole earth electronic link. And this is like a very big step forward for online communities. It was one of the, it's one of the oldest online communities. Um, I think it started in the late, eight, in mid eighties. Um, and so there are, instead of threads, they call them conferences. Here's one on Grateful Dead lyrics. So we can see kind of, kind of like the demographic crossover happening here. Um, okay. So the author and musicians I will be discussing today have created work that present alternatives to the championing of computing technology as an extension of human capability that one finds in such books as Turner's and as well as Marshall McLuhan's classic uh, media as an extension of man. Each of these artists share an engagement with historical paradigms of exclusion and oppression of people of color at the hands of science and technology from within Caucasian-dominated and associated techno-cultural realms, science fiction, and 1980s electronic dance music. This morning, I would like to present some music and books that creatively problematize Stuart Brand's idea of a harmonious union between humans and technology. On the campus of UC Berkeley during the free speech movement in the mid-1960s, it was not uncommon to see demonstrators wearing IBM punch cards like the one you see on the screen, used widely for university administrative data systems, tied around their necks and punched to spell out FSM, for free speech movement, or free speech. Students protesting for the right to organize on campus felt their personal agency was greatly at stake, subject to the university and the computer's control. However, a distinct countercultural group would emerge in Palo Alto that took a different approach to treating the loss of individuation. These were the new communalists, communalists, led and aided by Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog, who set out by the tens of thousands to live in communes, mostly in the West and Southwest United States, and who believed that computing technology held the blueprint for collective peaceful societies. Like many of his baby boomer peers, Brand rejected the requirements of 1950s adulthood he viewed as imperiling his sense of individuation. Brand and other new communists decided that in order to live by their own standards, they would need to construct a new society. This society would not function according to the hierarchies of bureaucracy, but instead closely followed cybernetic theory, systems-oriented approach that viewed the world and its inhabitants as part of one vast information system. 
The progenitor of cybernetic theory was Norbert Wiener, a mathematics professor at MIT during the Second World War, whose first breakthrough in applied cybernetic theory was the predictor anti-aircraft fire control system. The system followed the principle that the aircraft pilot um, the system followed the principle that the aircraft pilot and the gunman on the ground functioned according to a single self-regulating system, which Wiener compared to the self-regulating function in the human body known as homeostasis. Not funny, just lied. I hate this, but anyway. It's the only decent thing that came up when you Google homeostasis in images, so bear with me. As part of the same system, the behaviors of one actor, like the error committed by the pilot while, such as the error committed by the pilot while flying, could be transformed into data and exchanged and read by a computer, which was the predictor. So, pilot makes error, the predictor um, calculates the um, degree to which the pilot corrects his error and uses that data to shoot somebody. <laughs> okay. To quote Wiener, for this to occur, quote, it is necessary to assimilate the different parts of the system to a single basis, either human or mechanical. From this premise, the new communalists and Stuart Brand adopted the idea that individuals, through the use of small-scale technologies, had the same access to what Turner calls, quote, the invisible mesh binding the social and natural worlds, end quote, as the United States' as Secretary of Defense. Uh, this is a page from the Whole Earth Catalog, hard to see, so on the same page, so the Whole Earth Catalog was literally a catalog, you could order um, sort of like supplies for your communal life, um, so, such as a microcomputer, and um, Norbert Wiener's um, book on cybernetics. So as part of a self-regulating system, one group could not be in command over the other. This was the ideal. Although both the cyber-utopianists um, and early to techno artists would seek to reverse the controls exerted on them by technocracy through the embrace of said technology, the resemblance between the two stops there. Whereas the new communalists repurposed or reverse-engineered the mechanisms of their psychological fragmentation to create a harmonious cybernetic model for a new society, early techno projects Cybertron and Model 500 sought to place fragmentation between human and machine at the forefront of their practice. Furthermore, the interpretation of cybernetics as holistic and organism-based does not take into account the kind of fragmentation or even ghettoization that historically has excluded people of color from virtually all realms of computer or scientific-based culture, from science fiction to synth pop. However, creative deconstruction of this particular paradigm of exclusion from technology is not an unfamiliar concept if we look to the Afrofuturist works of speculative fiction by African-American female authors such as Octavia Butler. Following Maru Dubé's argument that, quote, critique of the enterprise of modern science, end quote, is achieved through, quote, more relational and embodied models of knowledge and identity, end quote, I hope to show that Techno's similar critique hinges on a cybernetic conception of self that presents itself as half done and perfect and irreconcilable with the history of slavery, which writer Ben Williams has referred to as, quote, the founding dislocation of modernity, the condition that lies at the heart of the global network that began with the colonial adventures of the great European powers, end quote. In the early 1980s, in quiet suburban communities nestled off of Interstate 75, halfway between Detroit and Ann Arbor, Derek May, Juan Atkins, Richard Davis, and Kevin Saunderson started recording music made from computerized beats and synthetic waveforms under such aliases as 3070, Cybertron, and Model 500. Their teenage years, marked by being the only African Americans, well, probably almost the only African Americans, in the predominantly white suburb of Belleville, um, um, would inform the way their music dealt into highly charged categories of braced music. The new electronic dance music from Europe, such as Kraftwerk, Gary Newman, and Giorgio Moroder, and the legacy of gospel, of gospel music constitute these two categories. 
Aware as they were of the perceived monopoly white music had on notions of technology and music, the early techno practitioners chose not to embrace the reaction espoused by proponents of the new black aesthetic movement. This is the idea that among, among African American musicians that, quote, white music is all technology and lacks the authenticity of what these critics refer to as our music. Critic and professor Ron Welburn has said that, quote, black musicians should reevaluate the technological intrusion now threatening our music. Our music is key to our survival, end quote. <coughs> However, according to popular music scholar Sean Alvarez, Atkins and Davis's 1980 proto-techno group Cybertron critically addressed such enmeshed music and racial identities, creating European-influenced high-tech music so as to, quote, mark a negotiation and subversion of whiteness and black cultural expectations. Regarding the choice of name, Model 500, for his proto-techno project in 1983, Atkins said that he, quote, wanted to use something that repudiated an ethnic des designation, end quote, and that he didn't want to have to look to, quote, the past and racial conflicts that required musicians to look to the street rather than outer space for inspiration. In creating music that displayed this existing opposition between the human and the technological Early Detroit techno artists musically deconstructed the utopian vision of the human machine espoused by Wiener and Brand. This is seen in the formal semiotic qualities of the Model 500 song, No UFOs, which I'll play in a minute. So a little description of the song. So following a grating on edge instrumental introduction and verse, the lyrics of the chorus come in, pointing to an alternative future beyond the control of a techno elite. These are not sung but recited with halting robotic delivery, dubbed twice on top of one another to the effect of obfuscating any human element. The lyrics of the chorus are, they say there is no go, they say no UFOs, why is no head hell high, maybe you'll see them fly. So we can roll that track and listen to like a minute, and 20, minute, uh, minute and 20 seconds or so. Techno in the early morning, that was great. <laughs> syncopated bass line repeating in an infinite loop in tandem with robotic hand claps, which writer Santa Rojola likens to, quote, the sound of an army marching, thousands of feet simultaneously hitting the ground, end quote. However, simple categorization of the hand claps as being mechanical and therefore white proves difficult, as the beat this army of robot marches to falls on the second and fourth beat of a 4-4 measure, a definitive rhythmic pattern in gospel music. However, the song structure is not structured and box-like, but infinitely linear. Due to the song's lack of resolution, Rahola finds the, quote, contradictions, frictions, or conflicts we have discussed to remain open. According to Model 500, full hybrid corporeality is impossible. The Afro-cybernetic being is prevented from realizing the holistic unary perfection of its white cousin. I want to further lay bare the historical contradictions present in Wienerian cybernetics through a discussion of alternate visions of Afrofuturism and Afro-American female authored speculative fiction, which encompass black feminism and trans species themes.
As English professor Madhu Dubé shows in her study of Octavia Butler's novel, The Wild Seed, themes and conventions present in Afrofuturist female authored fiction, such as the black heroine's transformation or identification with animal or fantastic animal hybrid species, represent deliberate employments of the fantastical not typically found in science fiction. Duvet goes as far as to place works like The Wild Seed within the category of black anti-science fiction in light of the history of, quote, predatory exploitation of black bodies and use of scientific theory for validating claims of black racial inferiority, end quote, in the name of scientific rationalism. According to Dubay, the otherness of nature and animals with respect to humans is symptomatic of, quote, a hierarchical separation dictated by an overestimation of reason. Therefore, when the heroine of Wild Seed transforms into a cheetah so that she doesn't have to forcefully mate with other supernaturally gifted witches whom her sly kidnapper has collected, the author affects a, quote, conversion of the symbolic identification of women with lower animals into a potent literary device. To quote Dubé once more, when An Anyanwu in Wild Seed becomes a dolphin or bird, readers are transported out of this discursive universe this discursive universe of racist society um, into the non-human world of actual animals. In light of this larger historical meta-narrative, meta violence, Dubé reiterate, re reiterates, quote, is what reduces both women to the, both women, she's discussing two books, so both women in both books, um, to the degraded level of animals or creatures who are dispossessed of their bodies. As such, black anti-science fiction constitutes a backlash against, quote, scientific practices and predatory exploitation of black bodies and scientific theory for validating claims of black racial inferiority, end quote. According to Dubé, this speculative fiction constitutes a, quote, counterculture of modernity. So if we relocate from Octavia Butler's writing desk to mid-1990s Detroit, it would seem that Detroit techno group Drexia saw similar opportunities for critique of rationalism in the Afrofuturist trans-species model. As an anonymous duo associated with the politically outspoken Detroit techno collective Underground Resistance, Drexia would take aim at the pretensions of the consummately whole cybernetic organism through the introduction of a mutant race called Drexians quote, a race of sea creatures mutated from pregnant African slaves who were thrown overboard during the passage to Africa. The boundary crisscrossing between historical reality, the historical reality of slavery, and ostensibly novel narratives and myths are found in the sleeve notes for the 1997 album, The Quest. I didn't include it. Okay, well, I'll describe it anyway. Um, these notes, which also include four notated maps showing first the slave trade, so the triangle right between uh, Portugal, West Africa, and uh, uh, the Indies. Um, so there's four maps. That one shows, one shows the slave trade, then the second is the Great Migration from the South to uh, cities like Chicago, Detroit, New York City. Um, third map shows um, the po global popularization of techno, so these are arrows radiating out of Detroit to cover the entire world. And then the final map, um, which is titled underneath the journey home, parentheses, the future, um, shows arrows um, that are directed from these American cities back, that all converged back in, on uh, the coast of Africa. So while oral similarities to early Detroit, early Detroit techno have been pointed out by authors the othering of Drexians by virtue of their non-human animal potential against the historical backdrop of slavery further complicates the machine-human model approached by early techno-practitioners. Through, quote, their theorization of a fundamental technological alteration in, rather than extension of, what it means to be human, end quote, the Drexians fulfill a similar conversion of the identification of Africans during the slave trade and long after as being inhuman, while at the same time presenting a negation of cybernetic humanist idealism. Countercultures of modernity are necessitated by visions of the future, expressed by dominated univocal narratives, <clears throat> which omit or exclude specific populations and identities. During the Cold War, this occurred in strategies taken by the United States Office, Office of Civil Defense to prepare civilians for a nuclear attack. These included racially segregated community shelters and abandonment of the city targets for a nuclear strike by mobile whites 
for their luxury, luxury family bomb shelters. The African Americans who remained in these urban areas were effectively left out of the survivalist discussion, which assumed means for stockpiling food, gas, etc. To illustrate, here is a map used by government security officials in which the ground zero blast epicenter is shown to be coincidental with the label, label Negro District. This kind of historic exclusion of African Americans from the future, as it stood during the Cold War, as well as ongoing barriers in computer science education, gives perspective to contemporary practices and new media art that deal with the all-encompassing media of data, medium of data. For example, I noticed while listening to the archives of 1990s Latvian art collective eLabs live streamed translocal DJ collaborations that a lot of the music they were mixing in cyberspace was, were techno subgenres such as house and drum and bass. I was then very disappointed to read <clears throat> eLab artist Raza Smite designate music <clears throat> in general as, quote, the least representable medium and, quote, perfect, perfect for highlighting or privileging the process of streaming over the content. So I'd like to conclude with the hope that my presentation today has raised some points of reference for relevant cases where criticism of technological processes is the content. Think of it as a kind of twisted take on the medium is the message. Thank you. Thank you, Our next speaker is Lee Kornfeld. She's going to be presenting A Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow, Walt Disney, General Electric, and the Failed Promise of Industrial Futurity. Lee? Lee's research examines the relationship between live performance and media technology in the practices of capitalist production. She received her MA in Performance Studies from NYU and is currently a PhD student in the Department of Art History and Communications at McGill University. Her recent publications include a chapter on Walt Disney and sexual pedagogies in the anthology A History of Evil in Popular Culture, a chapter of on feminist speech acts and Harry Potter in the anthology Hermione Granger Saves the World and a full TV critique of Spectacles of Shame and the Death Real Beauty campaign. Thank you, Lee. Do I use that microphone? Is this good? Can you hear me? Uh, good. <laughs> um, thank you, and thank you. To, uh, to all of the organizers. Um, I'm going to talk this morning about, uh, about a Disney World attraction called the Carousel of Progress. Um, a patriotic history pageant, the Carousel of Progress showcases an American family enjoying advances in industrial technology over the course of the last century, which is distilled into four short acts. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna trust that I'm on track with the slides, and if it seems like I get like, drastically off course, let me know when I fix it. So the, the Carousel of Progress uh, has four short acts, each representing a different decade. Disney calls the Carousel the longest running stage show of the American theater. It's been running almost nonstop since it debuted 50 years ago at the 1964 World's Fair. There, together with its sponsor, General Electric, the Carousel of Progress promised audiences a great, big, beautiful tomorrow, a future where the problems of domesticity would be solved by American industry, and a promise that clashes with the Carousel's present home in Disney World's Tomorrowland, a fantasy landscape redesigned in the mid-90s as a retrospective of lapsed futuristic visions, billed by Disney as the future that never was. This morning, following the Carousel of Progress's lead, I too am going to move through four different time periods, uh, but unlike the carousel, rather than celebrate the perpetual progress of industrial development, I'm going to track the carousel's shifting relationship to capitalist futurity. Uh, I might check some text. <laughs> uh, we begin in 1964 at the Carousel Theater at the New York World's Fair where the Carousel's theatrical celebration of historical domestic technologies served as a prelude to an exhibition of forthcoming General Electric products housed on the top floor of the Carousel Theater. Uh, to the extent that the Carousel of Progress has dramatic tension, that tension derives from anticipation of industrial products not yet on the market. Combining the commercial logics of an industrial trade show with the theatrical conventions of Western drama, 
The carousel transfigures the crisis-producing time lag that Marx identifies in capital, occurring after a commodity's creation, but before its exchange, into a theatrical device. So recall that for Marx, if the split between the sale, that is, the moment a product is put on the market, and the purchase, that is, the moment someone buys it, become too pronounced, then the intimate connection between them, their oneness, asserts itself by producing a crisis. We might consider expos, like the 1964 World's Fair, a corporate strategy for averting capitalist crisis by sparking enthusiasm for new products ahead of their entry onto the market. This is probably best illustrated by the final act of the carousel. Today our new... Yes, today our new all-electric home gives us lots more time to enjoy ourselves. In fact, it's a... Would you believe it? I'm cooking dinner. Or rather, my electric range is... So, you get the idea. Uh, the scene goes on, and they describe all of their amazing new uh, General Electric appliances. Each one gets its own sound effect and lighting cue. Uh, but the carousel did more than provoke consumer desire for an electric range. It heralded perpetual industrial development. Consider the final moments of the play, when the husband and wife talked about, spoiler alert, progress. <laughs> Yes, the progress of the last century has changed not only our homes, but also our transportation, recreation, and the places we work. Mother. It has brought us convenience and enjoyment we never knew before. Mother. Dear, you've hardly said a word. Why don't you say something? <laughs> well, I would like to say this much. Progress is something we can't take for granted. Progress takes a lot of people wanting it and willing to work for it. And so next, Mother and I invite you to come along and see some of the electrifying new ideas from General Electric for our city and for your own hometown. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow oh. shining at the end of every day. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow and tomorrow's just a dream away. It's catchy. <laughs> Uh, so in, in the, at the World's Fair after the scene, you could go upstairs and see a, a, an expo of, of new GE products. Um, but within the carousel, progress is strictly coded as industrial development. This is a play about progress in the United States in 1964, and there is no mention of the civil rights movement. The concluding act promises that GE technology will improve domestic life without altering its social order. The domestic sphere still squarely belongs to the wife, as the comic bit about her dominating the conversation makes clear, uh, even as her conversational control is a joke. A joke because, the act assures us, real authority continues to belong to her husband. Revolutionary technology, the carousel promises, will not bring about an actual revolution. At least, not an explicitly social or political revolution. But Disney did hope that technology presented by the carousel would alter the future of the American theater. I don't know how clear this is from, uh, from the photos uh, that we just saw, but the carousel of progress is performed by robots. <laughs> Developed by Walt Disney Studios for debut at the World's Fair, Disney hoped that its so-called audio-animatronic technology would revolutionize live performance the same way that its animation studios had revolutionized cinema. This matters because the carousel's theatricalization of progress girds its celebration of industrial capitalist futurity in two key ways. First, its script explicitly codes new technologies as constituting human progress. And second, its performers are, themselves, products of industrial technology. In 1964, the carousel's audio-animatronic cast functioned as ambassadors of the future they sang about. Writing about the carousel in 1977, theater scholar James Bierman surmised that uh, the development of audio-animatronic drama is a science fiction tale written in the future present tense. The only step remaining to create a superior breed of robot actors is that they become entirely self-balancing so that they can dance or leap in the air and land upright without support. 
when that step is completed, we can expect to see them colonizing stage spaces presently <laughs> reserved for live drama. So that is a bold claim. <laughs> um, and although Bierman went on to caution that technologies merely serve the interests of their users, within the carousel, the automated robots had clear implications for capitalist temporality. The robotic cast allowed the carousel to run non-stop. That they don't need to take breaks as human actors would is among their chief assets. More importantly, the circular theater was divided into adjacent segments where each act of the play could run simultaneously, uh, which allowed a constant influx of audiences. At the conclusion of each act, the audience seats rotated around the house. So Carousel of Progress had a double meaning. Just as the script presented technological progress, the audience took on the forward momentum of the script. So, in the spirit of forward momentum, uh, I want to jump ahead from 1964 to 1975. In 1975, following the opening of Disney World in Orlando, the Carousel of Progress reopened in the future-oriented Tomorrowland. The carousel had already spent nearly a decade at Disneyland in California, where it had moved after the close of the World's Fair. And in the intervening years, it had begun to show its age. In advance of its Orlando debut, Disney and General Electric made key revisions to the carousel, not only to update its vision of the future and the products it advertised, uh, but also to bring the past in line with new historical vantage points. Among its most prominent alterations was a new theme song that redirected emphasis from the future to the present. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow was replaced with a song called Now is the Time. From a business perspective, this shift makes sense. At Disney World, without the context of an industrial exhibition, GE sought to encourage the immediate purchase of products already on the market. Now is the time. Uh, but if emphasis on the present tense recalls the Marxist critique of capitalist circulation, it also echoes 1970s demands made by Marxist feminists to revalue domestic labor. Uh, so I'm going to repeat that. Now is the time, a Disney theme park anthem, urged audiences to buy new commercial technologies and to consider Marxist feminist demands. <laughs> Here's the clip. You can never underestimate the power of a woman. And speaking of women doing things, Mother is caught in a new do-it-yourself craze. She's remodeling our basement. There's something called a rumpus room. <laughs> Mother's pretty ingenious by using her food mixer for stirring paint. Oh, uh, that's my wife said. John. Yes, dear. I was just thinking. About what? That if you hired a man to do this, wouldn't you pay him? Of course, dear. Then I should get equal pay. Well, uh, <laughs> 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 then. Now is the time. Now is the best time. <laughs> I am not sure what to make of the dialogue and injection of Marxist feminism into a theme park ride at Disney World. Um, I am really curious to know what you think. This version of the carousel ran for almost 20 years. <laughs> then came 1994, when the carousel underwent its next major overhaul. I think it did. Oh, this paper is getting out of hand. I could use a little help. Now, Sarah, didn't I set up that clever automatic paint stirring machine for you? Yes, John, you're a genius. <laughs> Of course, this will ruin my food mixer. Not that you care. Oh, good old Sarah. Always the last lamp. <laughs> what happened, Sarah? I'll give you a new progress. That paint mixer of yours just sloshed paint across my room. I'm wondering what this debris will do to the room. <laughs> How do you like that? How do we say if you're going to be married, marry a girl with a sense of humor? <laughs> humor. <laughs> So we have these two uh, alternate visions of women's labor histories. I haven't played a recording of this scene from the 1964 version uh, because it's nearly identical to the one in 1994. In that version, the father announces that the mother is trying her hand at DIY and the lights go up on the mother falling off a ladder. 
um, a slight tweak is that the 94 iteration adds the closing pun on the words rumpus room and the mother's rump. Uh, in that sense, it aligns with a 90s turn toward post-feminism, characterized by a reassertion of gender essentialism that is underscored by an increased emphasis on women's bodies. If we understand the 90s version of the 1940s as an indication of political backlash, then the 75 version's rehearsal of Marxist feminist debate seems like a brief, momentary rupture of the carousel's capitalism. But consider that while in the 70s take on the 40s, the mother uses the paint mixer to enhance her domestic industriousness. In the 90s revision, the father uses the paint mixer to replace his domestic assistants. Interpreted in tandem, the scene's political economy of domestic labor continues without incident. For the breadwinning husband, domestic technology creates a life of leisure outside the hours of the working day. For his wife, the domestic fear persists as a site of perpetual labor. Considering these historical iterations in tandem shed light, sheds light on how the carousel interprets progress, whether buttressed by Marxist feminism or socialist feminism, or, or post-feminism, uh, capitalist political economy has always animated the carousel. Uh, but there is, I think, a radical shift in the carousel's manipulation of capitalist time. Where the 75 update accounted for contemporary political activism and struggled to incorporate a shifting vision of capitalist futurity, uh, with the 94 version, Disney began to give up on the future. This is indicated both by its revision of, both by its reversion to the social codes of a previous era, and by the fact that 20 years later, this is still the version of the carousel playing in Disney World today. To be clear, I am not arguing that by giving up on the future, Disney has given up on the endurance of capitalism, any more than I'm saying that the 75 version of the carousel means Disney has a critique of capitalism. It hasn't, and it doesn't. On the contrary, Disney's shift from anticipation of the future to nostalgia for the past indicates that the temporal affects animating capitalism can move backwards as well as forwards. This is made especially clear by the ways that the carousel has been redesigned to accord with the 90s revision of Tomorrowland as the future that never was, an ironic landscape dedicated to visions of the future that failed to emerge in accordance with Tomorrowland's adoption of a retro futurist aesthetic. The carousel acquired uh, a new sign, uh, which then became its logo, made of colorful gears, a symbol of circular rotation, sure, and also from the vantage point of the new digital era of clunky technology of the past. Uh, you can see in the background of the slide, you can see uh, that there are also like, bright colorful gears painted along the building. Um, so in its colorfulness, the Carousel Theater resembles the brightly lit roof of the original theater at the World's Fair. But the Orlando update is cute and campy, whereas the original was meant to dazzle. The contrast is even more pronounced if we consider the sleek Carousel Theater that housed the attraction during its intervening years in California. Even if we account for the fact that nighttime photography makes everything look better, <laughs> the 90s version still replaces the futurist aspirations of its predecessors with a nostalgic camp aesthetic. It's giant gears symbolizing mechanisms of the past, the very mechanisms that animate its once futuristic robotic actors. Uh, so, following Bierman's 77 declaration that audio animatronics were a science fiction tale, uh, in, were a science, ta a science fiction tale written in the future present tense. We might say that today they are relics of the future that never was, a story of speculative fiction written in the perpetual subjunctive. <laughs> I know I'm almost out of time. No, okay. oh. Fantastic. Uh, in that case, uh, before I close. I want to suggest potential for the sabotage of capitalist temporality embedded within the carousel of progress. If the theatrical axiom that audiences make each performance of a given production unique is true for all theatrical productions, it holds both more and less true in the case of the carousel of progress. It is less true. It might even be untrue 
because the production is pre-programmed. Every performance is exactly like every other. But with performers unable to respond to external events or affects, the character of any given audience has the power to literally override the production. YouTube is full of videos of the Carousel of Progress getting stuck with the audio, uh, so scenes where the same scene plays in a loop. Uh, trapped in a temporal loop, some audiences laugh and others get furious. And those differences are fascinating. But that's actually not what I want to show you right now. Um, I want to close with a different kind of video. I think it's going to be hard to follow along with because the scene it depicts is chaotic. It shows audience members actively soliciting the breakdown of the carousel. Uh, because the house of the carousel of progress rotates through the building, however slowly, audience members can halt the action of the play simply by standing up. Idiot smash hit. Millions of people came to see it. And since then, the carousel... Once again, everyone, please sit down. And the eggs of the theater of this show cannot continue. Experiencing all the new years. Damas y caballeros, por su seguridad, manténgase sentado. Si se mantienen de pie, el movimiento no se podrá establecer. Favor, por su seguridad, manténgase sentado para poder mover el teatro. Gracias por su atención. So in this audience, uh, saboteurs reject the carousel circulation and then the rest of the audience leaves without being granted permission to do so. Rather than anticipating an industrial future or reimagining the lapsed visions of the past, this audience demands a permanent present tense. Thank you, Lee. So, our next speaker is Anna Pringle talking about drones, contaminated dirt, and a an historical present of neocolonialism. Anna Pringle is currently completing a master's degree in the communications department at Concordia University. Pringle's research interests are robotics, critical animal studies, post-colonial thought, disability studies, and migration. Her thesis work focuses on drones and the relation of this technology to colonialism, resource ecology, bodies, food systems, and border militarism in the post-9-11 era. Outside of her research, she spends her time organizing around food sovereignty and migrant justice. She also enjoys making queer feminist noise and writing science fiction. Thank you, and thanks everyone for coming today. It's early. Um, the title of this paper is Drones, Contaminated Dirt, and a Historical Present of Neo-Colonialism. What I desire to do in this paper is to trace out how drones are entangled with the ecological. I intend to situate drone technologies in the current ecological crisis and a historical present of neo-colonialism. My concern about drones is triggered by an awareness of the militaristic, scientific, patriarchal environment in which the technology is emerging. Subsequently, I want to think about these machines in a way which understands that data mining relies on open pit mining. That robotics and information technologies, more broadly conceived, rely on rare earth metals, and that an intensive extraction industry is salivating at the potential proliferation of drones. Thinking about these military machines as environmental weapons asks that we begin thinking about much larger scales of violence than spectacle-driven media allows. To understand drone violence as the violence of the war on terror, instead of, for instance, its deployment as a domestic border security technology in North America, or its relationship to a global system of exploitive resource extraction that faces the technologies intertwining with multiple geographies of colonial and capitalist violence. 
Subsequently, in what follows, I will move through three different drone geographies. The first, Fallujah, Iraq. The second, the electronic waste dumps of Pakistan. And the third, the Canadian-American border. What I hope to accomplish by considering these ge geographies is to gesture towards the presence and futures that are foreclosed by the proliferation of these machines. I will conclude by contemplating what inventing better, queerer, more livable futures may look like. <clears throat> In the introductory lines of Pedagogies of Crossing, Jackie Alexander forcefully utters, I did not awake this morning to the deafening noises of sirens or the rocketing sound of non-stop bombs. I did not awake to the missiles that fall like rain from the sky, exploding on contact with land, staking out huge craters within the earth collapsing people into buildings, trees into rubble, men into women, hands into feet, children into dust, end quote. She writes that, she, that not waking up each morning to the deafening noise of sirens is the privilege of empire. I also did not wake up this morning to the deafening noises of sirens or the rocketing sound of nonstop bombs, nor did I wake up this morning thinking about whether or not my tap water was contaminated by the carcinogenic filled remnants of war. Birth defects permeate the Iraqi city of Fallujah. An increasing number of babies born, are born deformed every day. In Fallujah, another war is occurring on the cellular, le cellular level by way of the proliferation of cancers and leukemias. These children are born this way because of years of intensive Western bombing in the region. Depleted uranium and case bombs have been used since 1991 by US and NATO forces. These weapons were used in the first Gulf War against Iraq, then in the Balkans, and later after 9-11 in Afghanistan, Iraq, North Africa, Libya, and continue to be used to this day in drone strikes. What the use of these bombs is amounting to is a historical present of contaminated dirt, dirt birth defects, and cancer. The rate of congenital malformations in the city of Fallujah has surpassed even that of the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the nuclear bombs were dropped at the end of World War II. Histories of war live on in the soil and in the bodies of the people that live there. As Western countries instigate another bombing campaign, their militaristic enthusiasm void by a new threatening menace, uranium will continue to find a home in the dirt of Fallujah, thus shaping a plethora of bodies altering the future. Western citizens do not have to worry about the toxic legacies of depleted uranium. I use the term citizens on purpose to emphasize that only certain bodies in the West find themselves with a level of bodily security and comfort. Uranium is a critical industry for General Atomics, a primary producer of the American military drones, and thus further situates the drone industry in the Western military industrial complex within a history of environmental practice is which adversely impacts communities of color and indigenous peoples. For instance, the needs of war massively explode the denning people of Great Bear Lake in the Northwest Territories to uranium um, during the Second World War. The Dene people were, there was a uranium mine in, North, in the Northwest Territories where the Dene people helped make the atomic bombs used in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And in the years since those bombs were dropped in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, cancers have proliferated in Dene bodies. Uranium lives on. In addition to the uranium extraction necessary for the bombs these machines are dropping, drones are constructed out of rare earth metals. Minerals which are crucial to the production of a variety of informatic technologies such as the smartphones and computers a majority of Western consumers use. Considering this, Parika writes, the long-lasting legacy of Silicon Valley will be its soil and the heavy concentration of toxins that will last much longer than the businesses and remind us of the geological afterglow of the digital hype. Drones, war, and Western techno-capitalism are in a symbiotic relationship with the global system of exploitive resource extraction. While I do not claim to a pre-technological, untouched, pristine environment, for that trajectory only gives strength to colonial nature society but binaries, my hopes for alternate futurities do not rest in drones. As R. Millet et al. point out, the rise of robotics will accelerate a plethora of environmental issues, which followed the advent of microelectronics. Waste, one of these issues, is primarily stored and partly recycled in developing countries and leads to very high levels of toxic compounds in the air, soil, and water. Pakistan, another area where the dirt and bodies archive the violences of war by way of uranium legacies, has also become a refuse for transnational flows of electronic waste. Drone strikes hit the region as an electronic waste industry swells. 
Electronic waste includes all the disposable information technologies of the ever-consuming West. The old laptops, MP3 players, keyboards, television sets, cell phones, the list goes on. A friend of mine recently told me that you can now buy drones at 7-Eleven convenience stores in the U.S. The American dream now includes owning your own personal drone. A drone that will one day become outdated and thrown away. As time passes, so-called developed countries are dumping more and more of electronic waste on the developing world to process. What the processing of electronic waste results in are the construction of new bodies, bodies that are toxic and ill. These toxins do not respect boundaries, threatening the health not only of workers, but also of current residents and future generations living in the local environment. These toxins are leaching into the ground, the bodies of a variety of species, as well as the bodies of children and pregnant women, for even relatively low levels of exposure can cause serious and sometimes irreversible neurological damage threatening the development of the child. Only certain bodies cohabit with these toxic objects, and these bodies' and orientation towards the toxic emerges due to the historical. While consumer electronics are different than military machines, they are made of the same stuff. Materials that are called rare earth metals for a reason. Um, when a computer dies, it continues to live on in the environment and be present for a variety of bodies, although the Western user may no longer have to see it. I bring up electronic waste to draw attention to the implication of Western consumers in the toxic geographies of planned obsolescence capitalism, as well as to get us thinking about what drones will eventually become. The information age has led to the conjuring up of images of high-tech society liberated from the constraints of nature space, time, gravity, that have defined the boundaries of all previous civilizations. What must be emphasized is that as abstract and virtual as many of us would like to believe the computer age might be, all of our machines and technologies are made using petroleum, water, metals, and chemicals that are earth-based and finite. Nothing about the high-tech global economy is weightless or virtual. The regions permeated with depleted uranium become unlivable, as do the regions permeated with toxic electronic waste. The contaminated dirt of these regions is Western-made climate change. Our futuristic, high-tech lifestyles make other regions of the world unlivable, triggering forced displacement and mass migration. In thinking about displacement, I turn to Nixon's radical notion of displacement, one that, instead of referring solely to the movement of people from their places of belonging, refers rather to the loss of the land and resources beneath them, a loss that leaves communities stranded in a place stripped of the very characteristic that made it habitable. One of the first appearances of a drone in so-called Canadian-American airspace is over Agusas in Mohawk Territory, an indigenous community straddling the Canadian-American border, along the St. Lawrence River that covers portions of New York, Quebec, and Ontario. The Agusasne landscape is no stranger to the toxicities of colonialism, a General Motors site has already leaked carcinogenic chemicals into the land, the breast milk of women's bodies and animals. The community has undergone, undergone Nixon's displacement without moving due to the toxic waste of industry in the region. Colonialism has made Agwasazni lands unlivable. American officials have explained the launching of drones in the Great Lakes area as an effort to prevent the flow of drugs, migrants, and terrorists. Recently, RCMP allocated over $90 million for the expansion of a surveillance program in the community, drones playing a critical part in the budget. An indigenous scholar, Audra Simpson's work on the recent transformations of the border apparatus, she writes that since 9-11, Mohawk bodies, narratives, and arguments became folded into the seemingly newer threat to settler sovereignty and security, the illegal alien, the always possible terrorist, rendering perhaps all bodies of color as border transgressors with the presumed intent to harm. This perception of threat makes possible the, de the, the deployment of drones on western border borders, as well as the intervention of drones ab abroad. What border drones, especially the drones on the northern border, which is the Canadian-American border, will shore up in the region is neocolonial notions of sec security, and what this effectively means and necess necessitates is an expansion of the prison industrial complex and the prison industrial complex is simply just made profit profitable by the imprisonment of indigenous and racialized bodies. Where this gets increasingly scary is when we try and link the militarization of northern borders and the North American borders to what is going, on, going what is occurring in abroad via imperialist wars and resource extraction. 
In 2003, a Pentagon report pronounced a security threat posed by millions of climate refugees, predicting that rich nations like the US would have to respond by building defensive fortresses around their countries. In response, Nixon writes, that the militarization of borders is a conventional neoliberal response, wall off the wealthy, raise the walls of denial. Just two days ago, a large expansion, like a, I think it's like a 900 kilometer fence was announced for the northern border, the Canadian American border. So I think what I'm trying to emphasize in this part of the talk is that all of our, all of these policies in, in the Middle East and the different um, developing nations that create environmentally toxic conditions end up forcing and creating mass migration. And then the solution is just to put drones on the border and create huge fences to keep masses of bodies out of the country. Um, to continue, uh, while the drones in the area do not pose the same environmental threat to Agosazni bodies as other colonial industries like the General Motors plant, border drones remain linked to a broader colonial security schematic, protecting Western economies and their citizens. The securitization of Western borders occurs simultaneously to the making the lands of others unlivable. The security of Western nations is contingent on the making terrorist, making imprisonable, and making killable of other bodies. Le Duc captures the destructiveness embedded in current articulations of terrorists in her comment that someone needs to explain to me why destroying, why proposing to destroy water with chemical warfare doesn't make a corporation a terrorist. In conclusion, I turned to a talk Haraway recently gave in which she offered the words, I'm not post-human, I'm compost. Um, I love that statement, but um, an audience member prickled by this aphorism asked, are you taken by the idea of compost because the way mach machines refuse to break down? To which Haraway replied, no, as machines do get repurposed and they do rust and they do break down, just maybe not in agriculturally interesting ways. A comment that lends itself to the question, how can we develop machines that do break down in agriculturally interesting ways? I think a lot about the lives and the afterlives of the machines in my life. I've had a computer that I just refuse to get rid of, even though it's so slow at this point and I can't even use it, but I just don't want to keep recreating this system of use and get rid of, so I should learn more how to hack, but that's another thing. Um, and within that, my thinking finds inspiration in UC Perica's notion of zombie media of hacking purportedly dead media to bring it back to life in an effort to move towards sustainability rather than disposability. Um, my thinking is also encouraged by the vibrancy of indigenous-led and migrant-led environmental movements. Um, indigenous-led communities have been thinking about environmental sustainability forever, not just after Al Gore said it. Um, and finally, my technological curiosity is also pricked by scientific research that is being done to think about ways we can detoxify an extremely toxified world, whether this be by creating transgenic plants that mix different properties of plants in effort to kind of engage this detoxifying principle that is in nature. Um, it takes uranium billions of years to decompose. As iterated earlier, the processing of electronic waste that does take place for the most part occurs in the global south where workers as well as those living in the region are exposed to the material contaminants contained in obsolete technologies. All of this waste is just in our environment as it's there and I think that's, I think this theme of the conference of this panel is so interesting because how can we create better futures when there are just actual parameters of waste that are going to be there for a while and that's something I am very consumed by thinking is Given all of this toxicities in the environment, how can we start thinking and dealing with that mess that is there and that's permeating the ground and bodies? Um, and somehow creating compo compostable machines is not enough. One machine that I thought was really interesting is I found a computer someone had, I think it was a project, a computer someone had made out of completely cardboard material, trying to think about ways to make the digital just more sustainable than it is currently. but. Um, at the same time, the answer isn't always just creating new and better commodities. Um, green and white supremacist capitalism will not do. Um, we're all in this together, but we're not all the same. An obvious statement, but important to think about. Always when we're trying to think about environmental, like a global environment that we all share, but that we're all infinitely different in. Um, 
trying to think compostable machines means obsessing over the differences between bodies while simultaneously understanding that our shared vitality is contingent on the vitality of the earth. In a globe that is warming, certain bodies are certainly feeling the heat before others, while others definitely are living the privileges of empire, and in this I would include a high-tech society where you can go on Facebook whenever you want and buy a new computer whenever you want. Um, thus, in thinking about cre creating sustaining machines and within that a sustainable earth, it means centering and taking guidance from those already affected by the toxicities of a global neocolonial economy. Rather than reproducing the machines of patriarchy, it means thinking about compostable machines and also learning about histories of settler colonialism, land devastation, and the afterlifes of our technologies, our waste, and our wars, and how those afterlifes perpetuate pr processes of sexism, racism, and ableism. Thank you to our presenters for these amazingly thought-provoking papers. Apart from the links of futuring, these papers all speak to the tension of whether the future and its technologies will cause a social or political revolution, whether that be racial, gender, sexual, or ecological. These papers furthermore raise the question of who the future is for. Which, for, for whom is which version of the future beneficial? I want to thank the presenters for raising these questions for all of us. I'll open the floor now to questions. We have about 20 minutes um, left to talk with all the presenters. And if, when you ask questions, can you please make sure to speak loudly so that way it can be caught for the recording and also so everyone can hear. Um, so if you... <coughs> Um, I was noticing the terms speculative, speculative fiction and science fiction being used uh, both, and I was wondering if there's an important distinction to any of the speakers between the two and reason for using it different ones at different times. distinctions that may or may not exist to uh, from the way that I was using it now. Uh, I'm going to answer this question a little bit differently than I think the way you're asking it. Um, sorry. The, 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 my end to science fiction is this weird prediction that the future of theater is going to become robots. Uh, and But the specific quote that, that science is uh, story is a science fiction story written in the future present tense. It's not a particularly rigorous sentence for two reasons. One is that if we think about the, dis the distinction between speculative fiction and science fiction as uh, if science fiction is like the impossible and speculative fiction is something that might happen, the Margaret Atwood's distinction is not aliens, right? Like for her, speculative fiction is uh, a fantasy that could happen as opposed to a fantasy that couldn't happen. Um, a science fiction story written in the present tense doesn't really make sense because then that would mean that it is happening. But I think that we can think about that as part of this like really bold claim, right? That we can make the impossible happen and it can happen in the future present tense. Here's the other reason that that sentence troubles me. There is no such thing in English as the future present tense. <laughs> um, but and I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> In Spanish, it means something else. I, 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 I welcome us. Um, I think that actually, it's possible that the, the impossibility of the future present tense actually ends up aligning with the impossibility of science fiction, but I, this is probably more specific than you're asking. <laughs> OK. Um, um, well, we've gotten somewhere with that one, I think. <laughs> But um, as far as the distinction between speculative and science fiction, well, it's funny because I was thinking that I actually, I read a, a 
definition that's in conflict with yours about <laughs> science fiction, but I don't know if we have any like, you know, lit majors in the room. But um, as science fiction as being occurring in the present, actually, yeah, as a possible present, like reality. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, because I think it's actually very di like very difficult for um, for for anyone to read a book that is not being read in the present, that is not taking place in their in their minds in the present. I just think it is something that is like physically impossible there <laughs> in terms of cognition. <laughs> um, as far as yes, the um, Octavia Butler's uh, supposed use of the term speculative fiction, it's 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 uh, at first I think a political um, 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 rejection of the word science foremost. And I think it's political also, um, I didn't really talk about it, but um, I mean, yeah, science fiction is, is predominantly as this cultural kind of like baggage of being like white and male. And uh, what's his name? Walter Gibson, William Gibson? It's like ever quoted and every single like reader on like network technology is just like, oh, okay, we got to <laughs> jack into the matrix or whatever. Um, so yeah, just making a very like you know bold distinction between those, um, between like uh, speculative. I think for 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 Octavia Butler goes to back into the past. Like her books take place in 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 a very distant past, um, and not the future. One where there is there are there is but there still ex race still exists and black bodies exist. So those are very real things, and um, the fact that she's going back there and and undermining that the quality of humanness using trans species themes, I think is just a very different um, approach than science fiction. If anyone else disagrees, that's great. Sorry, what comes to my mind immediately is I think the term speculative fiction was coined by Robert A. Heinlein, and he, do you feel like that history of the term has any relevancy given how much, pro, how terribly Heinlein dealt with race in his books? I'm thinking in particular of Farhan's Freehold, just a terribly racist book. Um, and so like the origin of, do you think that origin of the term from a very white, like the I hate to, I can't think of a better way to put it, but other than like a very, from a very white, very male writer. Um, like that's, do you think that origin of the term has any impact? I don't recall seeing a footnote about him when I read this essay, but um, it's an interesting thought. I mean, the fact that I mean, I'm sure this this English professor would have would have been aware of uh, the reference you're making. Okay. So I don't know. I think speculative is just kind of a handy, handy word. Yeah, I think it was originally coined to, like, as an umbrella term for both science fiction and fantasy for oh, a yeah. term to refer to both. But then it kind of got more used, I think, to, um, uh, well, yeah, in the ways you're saying, and also just. Uh, in an attempt to break some of the stigma associated with science fiction in the literary community. Yeah, right. Um, next question. Uh, I have a question that's trying to put in a day conversation because I keep thinking of them together. Thanks for your talks. They were super interesting. And I want to start from Anna, kind of where you were ending, which is on how do we imagine better futures within the parameters of waste right, and warming and occupation that you described. And it gets me thinking about Lee's paper on a technology that has been kept alive for 50 plus years in some pretty terrifying ways. And where we have these examples of sabotage being performed, um, you know, maybe not in a mainstream context, but we can find this on, on YouTube. And sort of thinking about sort of based on how you were describing different techno and the, specifically tracing it back through Fred's work uh, on um, well, right, and on, on the catalog where you have a kind of lifestyle guide that is ostensibly communalist, right, but is deeply consumerist at the same time and totally tied into your critique of Silicon Valley. 
right? So my question, if I can come up with one, <laughs> is how do we see not just better futures, but see the waste and the parameters of waste that you describe? Like, how do we make those things visible in ways that become much more knowable, right? Because we have so many visibilities around war making and drones, and the art that we see in like Trevor Paglin's work is really about making satellites and drones beautiful, I would say, and the context of seeing them beautiful, and you don't see the devastation, right? Or you see, you know, really right-wing ideological shows like Homeland, right? Sort of giving us other ways of making this visible. But, you know, is the model that sort of Lee has presented to us, where we kind of sort of map out a kind of history of a particular fantasy of technology that completely fails one model? Or are you thinking of some other models, maybe, sort of how to do this work, perhaps? Or sort of things you're things you particularly like or think are, are, are particularly inventive ways of doing that. Does that yeah. question make sense? Okay. Um, is I, I completely agree with you. Is with, with everything about drones, it's a very flashy kind of spectacle-driven media thing, yeah. as well with drone strikes and the wars. That, that's a really easy, fast, clickbait way to kind of think about violence and think about Western harm. But to begin imagining, it's it's from a book um, Rob Nixon wrote called Slow Violence and Environmentalism of the Poor. And he, he terms it um, slow, slow violence. And it's these types of violences that occur over decades, over centuries, that are environmental violences, that are just these much, much large, larger time scales of violence than kind of terrorist or a drone or something that is very aesthetic and pure and spectacle driven, is yeah. it's trying to capture these long genealogies and these long histories that surround to unlivable births and unlivable lives. And I think that's, I, I don't know, I feel like that's the challenge presented to scholars, activists, um, artists in kind of the contemporary moment of ecological crisis is how we can begin fathoming the scale of damage. There's, there's two things I want to say. They don't actually, they're not totally related. Um, okay. Plus, <laughs> uh, well, I mean to each other, they're related to, they're meant related to your question. Well, as I was thinking, I was thinking during your, uh, while you were speaking, that something I don't really get into, I don't think I get into it at all in the context of this presentation, is all of the, um, all of the technology that is required to make robots like this work. Uh, but when the carousel premiered, it was a big deal. Um, there's like a TV special, and you go back, you go behind the scenes, and you see Walt Disney animates the. He, he introduces it, and he calls the the they go into like a like the room that houses all of the tape that has the performance recorded in it. And it's huge. It's 1964, um, and he calls it the brain of of the audio animatronics. So I wonder if there's a way to think about. Um, where you locate uh, control in materiality in that way. Um, the way that the, the excess technology itself becomes, like, control is designated to that as opposed to the human operators and how that factors in. I don't think that's exactly what you're asking, but it's, it's, it's kind of related. Um, do you mean like the like geographical location of? Because I mentioned like the computational metaphor, where people, even like psychologists in their studies, even today when they when they try to describe the brain, use resort to words like bandwidth for attention span and things like this. So you're saying like, how is that? How is that made visual? Um, yeah, and also how how is it? Or I think actually maybe in the opposite way. Like how is the how is the like the existing materiality turned into like, a, like an image of the other way around? Right. Yeah. Oh. Um, thanks for your talks. Um, this is mostly directed to Eleanor, although anybody can answer it. Um, I was thinking about like the way that you were talking about hybridity in your talk. So between like human and animals in Butler or in Detroit techno, 
like humans and machines and like an imperfect human. And thinking about that in relationship to, I don't know if you know Tavia Nyango's work on, um, okay, so he's basically talking about hybridity um, in US history and how like racial hybridity um, is held up both by conservatives as like the horrible dystopian future of everybody being mixed race or by progressives on the other hand as like this progressive future where we're all the same because of like racial hybridity mixing into one. Um, and uh, Nyong'o is talking about that specifically and how that maps onto discourses of like post um, racism. So, you know, like we could all be in this like post racial world if everything just became hybrid. Um, so I was wondering like what those ideas of hybridity have to do potentially with the hybridity that you're talking about, like in the Detroit techno scene that you're working in or thinking about like, um, what, how does the human machine hybrid like relate to racial hybridity, if at all, or like uh, also in Butler too? That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think that the hybridity, yeah, I think there's a there, there might be like a uh, kind of technical distinction there because the hybridity that um, the artists I discussed um, we're working with it is is kind of more like idea based and um, like yeah less 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 concrete I think. Um, but you were like you know so you were holding up these like uh, hybridities and techno and Butler as like a positive like way of critiquing like racializing structures, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you're saying like what comes next after that? You're saying like? Well, so I was wondering about the potential like negative uh, potentialities yeah. of like hybridity, how like, you know, mainstream discourse uses that in this way that maps onto post-racial um, discourses and stuff like that. Yeah, I don't think, yeah, well, I might have held them up as positive, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's negative that there is that distinction in the first place between, that, that allows you to, us to use the word hybrid in the first place. And I think that's what's actually being critiqued. So whether or not, it's tricky, whether or not like w w what they want is, is this um, like post-hybrid scenario. Like I think it's, I think it's, it's mostly, I mean, uh, sort of like it's like, more rhetorical than that, I think, maybe. We have time for one more question. Okay, um, so, um, in defense of capital, um, I noticed that both of you guys had, you know, there was definitely a sort of, you know, definitely an anti-capitalist, you know, venture message. Um, I'm just kind of wondering to what extent um, that's useful at this point. I mean, as you said, you know, the, the, the great Marx quote, you know, the difference, you know, that what, what the, 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 when the amount of time between the sale and the purchase is too long, you have a crisis, right? Well, I mean, possibly, arguably, the greatest example of that in our time is Marxism itself. I mean, you know, we have, a, you know, it was sold to us, right, in the, in, you know, in the teens and twenties, and um, a tremendous amount of time, you know, has intervened and has never been practiced, right? So I'm just wondering to what extent challenging these, you know, severely negative trends, militarism, um, you know, this sort of consumer, this, oh, this, you know, um, the materialism and so on and so forth, is that, is doing so in a, from a socialist standpoint productive at this point? Or is it more productive perhaps to do the same thing as these techno guys in Detroit, to adopt the system that we're in and to work with them? Sorry. <laughs> Um, I, I'd start, but I, I, you could maybe answer this first, but I don't know if the techno artist in Detroit necessarily adopted the system versus disrupted the system that they were in is a distinction I'd make. Um, beyond that, I, I, is that I think there's immense use in an anti-capitalist critique at all times. Um, we can problematize what that critique looks like. It might look like socialism, it might look like anarchism. It might look like decolonization movements, um, but given the immense intertwining of 
capitalism with environmental devastation and death and war, <laughs> I, I feel uncomfortable saying that there's no use for an anti-capitalist critique. I think it's a really good question. Um, I, I think that the, I wouldn't necessarily, I don't, I don't see the critique that I was making as specifically a Marxist one, actually. I mean, I think it aligns with Marxism, but it's not like a, like a particularly rigorous, I think there's a difference between a Marxist critique and an anti-capitalist one. Um, and I think that there are a lot of different ways that you can get at critiquing capitalism. One of the things that like I find so delightful about this like, super weird ride is that it, uh, it has so many, there's so many different ways of tracking the way that capitalism operates in it. Um, like specifically, I mean, I think I said this right, like, like there's this, there's this like weird moment in the 70s that then lasts for a bit of time where there's like, like a rehearsal of a very specific uh, Marxist feminist debate that was happening at that moment. But I don't think that that rehearsal in Disney World means that Disney World is critiquing capitalism, right? So one of the interesting things about that is, is to say like, okay, well, how is it operating at this point? Um, I do think that the way that the, the uh, this, because the spectacle itself is designed to like celebrate the endurance of capitalism forever, or specifically through General Electric, and I didn't get into this, there's a whole thing about the way sponsorship works. Um, I don't know how to critique that without critiquing capitalism, um, unless you were to critique it from like a marketing standpoint to say like, well, I don't know if this is an effective way to sell this product. <laughs> uh, that would be hopefully for a different panel. <laughs> So yeah, I guess um, in my talk, I, I, I was conflating the ideas of technological progress and the use of the electronic equipment by Detroit techno musicians, correct? Is that what you got? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's like, initial, like that was the, that was the kind of, like, like this word rhetorical um, scenario being, being a, a, like placed on the table by these artists. But as time progressed, they kept using the same exact um, sequencers and and synthesizers, which are now, which at the time were like cheap and available because they were already kind of outdated, and now and now everyone's um, so, so there's this kind of funny like like retro retro consumers is that the word okay, mm -hmm. retro consumers um, uh, that, that occurs there. Um, so so I'm saying like maybe those people have missed the point or they're stuck on some other point. Um, I think what, how we can talk about this in the present as far as um, capitalism and, and technological progress in the electronic music context are concerned um, are how um, there are people clamoring for synthesizers for, for you know, TR3s or whatever, uh, paying loads of money for them or getting for Christmas or whatever. But um, at the same time, you have like artists, mostly I think noise musicians, who, um, you know, like, Nate Young, like, kicking around a Walkman on the floor. Um, and, and so with the, um, uh, the existent notion of, like, of, of, this is what actually spurred me to write this paper in the first place, because I'm reading this, this, this cybernetic stuff that I have to read for class with Norbert Wiener and everything, and I'm like, well, no, this has already been done before. The f as soon as, like, people figured out how to use, like, rec recorded tape, uh, Samuel Beckett, um, that, that was already like done in the cultural sphere already, in that in that in, in making these like rhetorical objects. Um, so I think that that could be an interesting place to go as far as like contemporary musicians using found broken disc mat, and it doesn't even matter whether they make noise or not. If they, if they have electromagnetic like, frequency, or whatever, you can pick it up with a microphone. So it's like it's, it can be like the most minute level of functioning and still um, exist in this, like be used in the context of human machine, human time machine equals cultural production. Well, we're out of time, so thank you again to our panelists. And I believe we have a 15 minute break before the decolonizing the future panel. So thank you.